Okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Today is our webinar on indigenous culture and death denial. My name is Deborah Jacobs. I'm the executive director of the Ernest Becker Foundation. The Ernest Becker Foundation was founded in 1993 by Dr. Neil LG. The mission of the organization is to spread awareness of Ernest Becker's synthesis. And over time, the Ernest Becker Foundation has sponsored events, supported research, and developed content related to Becker's theories and the science that has developed in the form of terror management theory in the years since Becker wrote The Denial of Death and The Birth of Death and Meaning. Um, we're really honored to have our guests with us today and I won't take up a lot of time. I do wanna let you know that you can post questions on YouTube in the chat, which I think is on the lower right side. This webinar will be recorded and made available later if you wanna share it. And uh, with that, I will pass the lead over to Dr. Lindsay Harville Bowman. She is an associate professor at the School of Communication Studies at James Madison University. And I will invite her to tell us a little bit about her work and herself, as well as being our moderator for the rest of this program. So welcome, Lindsay. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thanks, Deborah. Um, so like Deborah said, my name is Lindsay Harville Bowman. I'm an associate professor at JMU. Um, I am in the School of Communication Studies, but my other two departments would most likely appreciate if I gave them a shout out as well. I'm also in the Department of Graduate Psychology as well as the Department of Psychology. I lead the Terror Management Lab at James Madison University where we investigate issues surrounding terror management theory. And I am also a uh, enrolled member of the Osage Nation, which our reservation is located um, in Northern Oklahoma, even though I reside in Virginia. So today I wanna to tell you just a little bit about the format of how today will go. Um, each of our panelists will be giving brief introductions as well as opening um, statements about their relationship with Becker's ideas, and or mortality in general. And then after that, we'll have a moderated Q&A by yours truly. Um, and so make sure that you post um, questions in the YouTube uh, area if you would like to have a question asked of our fabulous panelists. So to begin, I will give a brief um, introduction on how uh, Becker's ideas relate to my research, and then we will move on to our panelists. So I was first introduced to Becker during my graduate program at the University of Oklahoma. Interestingly, I was learning about Becker's ideas right as my advisor passed away. So Ernest Becker was incredibly instrumental in getting through that grief process and still is today. It's been 11 years, but obviously it's still, still there. So, um, and then also took a leading role in my research because my research after my advisor died took a little bit of a death approach <laughs> after that. So that's a little bit about my relationship with Becker. And now we'll go to a Lamar Spotted Elk. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Harvell Brown Bowman. <clears throat> um, I think my first time getting experience with Becker, I'm trying to really think about it. I think I read his stuff and as, as being interested in anthropology. And so I think my first time was just reading some articles about him where he showed deference to tribal people. And I think that really resonated with me and um, Becker argued. Um, I think in that article, if I remember, he argued that sometimes we look back at tribal peoples and we're looking back at ourselves and, and we sometimes have this ego about we're more advanced, our civilization's more advanced, but Becker wanted us to reconsider that and he cited all, as well as other anthropologists like Claude Levi Strauss, who said, oh, we might actually be descending rather than uh, always achieving as we want to believe our society is. And, and he pointed to a lot of different things about um, some of the things that are maybe going on in our study now, like our our wellness and our mental health and things like that, that our, our ability to relate to each other. And, he, and they predicted these things, and this is in the 70s and 60s, that some of these would be going away. And so I think that resonated with me because um, I think certainly as a member of my tribe, Northern Cheyenne, 
but also being multicultural. Um, my mother's white. You know, I had that view. I had that view to see why there were so many good things, so many positive things, so many things that edifies me, certainly as a tribal member, and why those things weren't allowed to exist in society and in the institutions of society, you know, like politics, like education. Um, and so I, it made me beg that question, it made me want to know why that was, why these were being um, censored, if you will, or being suppressed or marginalized. And so I think Becker really resonated with me and it, and it led me to read <clears throat> Denial of Death, of course, and, uh, and, and all his other works. And I think um, Becker, to this day, is, a, is one of my certainly profound books that I've ever read and certainly has impacted and influenced me to this day. Thank you, Lamar. Could you tell us just a little bit about what you're up to now and where you're currently living? Yeah, um, I'm in, I've been in education for over 20 years. Um, I started off as a teacher. I worked in higher ed and I worked in uh, elementary schools even. And um, then I became a counselor, a school counselor. And I worked that for a number of years. Uh, currently I'm an administrator in the Salt Lake City School District, uh, working in a K-8 school. Uh, here at Nibley Park School. Great, thank you. All right, Sheldon spotted out. I'm Lamar's younger brother, um, even though I know sometimes people confuse me as being the older brother. I think it's not because of the wrinkles on my face. I think it's because of my maturity. <laughs> but uh, actually, I was introduced uh, to Becker through uh, Lamar, actually. And so, like, I think Lamar, um, I was in undergraduate school at the time, and I think he introduced me to uh, Ernest Becker. And it, and it really, I think, very similar to Lamar's experience with that, just affirming um, and, and gave me an explanation of why cultural, tribal cultural identity is not, is, is marginalized in our society. And, and of course, there's a history of forced assimilation for tribal peoples, um, forced boarding school. Um, so it, I don't know, it really helped affirm or give me a better, or just a, a more exp expansive worldview on why that is. Um, I ended up going to law school, which is probably the most colonizing thing you could possibly do. <laughs> so um, that's what I went in my education. And I end up work, like I do a lot of work with child welfare. Um, and of course, children are, uh, our immortality projects in a lot of ways. Uh, and so like I, I see this, how to even influence his decisions that are being made in that terror management sense of, uh, of the work of Sheldon Solomon and, and all those uh, uh, great people, how this shows up in court uh, on a daily basis even, you know, of how um, that history of colonization and that there's a story of this throughout the whole world of, of colonizing Europeans coming into land, uh, stealing land, <laughs> uh, forcing assimilation. And when that's not working with adults, uh, trying to kill them and still children, you know? And so there's a whole history of that all throughout the world. Um, and so it gave me a better and more expansive view of, of, of an explanation for that or inspector's work did. Um, I am Northern Cheyenne, like Lamar. Um, our tribe, we're a warrior tribe actually. And so um, we're the tribe that killed George Armstrong Custer in uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, so that's our great gift to humanity. That's our tribe's gift to humanity there. So um, you're welcome. Um, and I think also part of that, just like uh, our dad grew up sh very Cheyenne. Um, he had a Cheyenne worldview. Um, and, and our mother, as Lamar's talking about, she's, uh, she's white and grew up in Lily White Ogden, Utah. Uh, and so the juxtaposition of their cultures, I think there was, uh, we, we sat on this fence, you know, and I, I think we, we sat on a fence that we were able to observe two different things going on. We grew up in a tribal community. Um, and so we were able to see the juxtapose of, of, of how racism even shows up today uh, in 2020 and uh, in, in our childhood. So I think there was a lot of explanation that gave me a, a better insight to that. Um, what I do professionally is I do a lot of work with tribal child welfare. Uh, there is a federal law called the Indian Child Welfare Act. I provide some consultation on that as well. Um, I get to sit on a tribal court bench uh, as an appellate court judge. Um, so I get to do a lot of uh, legal work throughout the country. Uh, so that's who I am. Thank you, Sheldon. All right, last but not least, Tanya Ball. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. 
It's the new headphones. I got new headphones. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm broadcasting live from my basement. <laughs> I So I'll just start out introducing myself. My name is Tanya Ball. I identify as a Métis woman. I My family is from Treaty 1 territory in Canada, which is actually modern day Winnipeg. So I was born in Winnipeg, but my family is actually from, it's a, it's a small Métis village, which is kind of north, um, I believe it's northeast, probably about an hour and a half drive north of Winnipeg called St. Ambrose. So my family name is Lapine, and I'm not sure, I imagine you're not too familiar with Canadian history, but um, one of the famous, I guess, rebellions, or people call it rebellion, we call it a resistance. So we have the Red River Resistance, and that was led by a Métis man called Louis Riel. And my ancestor was actually Lou Riel's cousin and right-hand man. So that's always really good. It's always fun to tell these kinds of stories. <laughs> when Sheldon mentioned that that one battle, I was like, wow, yeah, we all, we all have those stories, right? Um, so I am currently a PhD student. I am attending the University of Alberta. So I'm currently living in Edmonton, which is, or we like to call it, um, Amiskwichi Wiskaigan, which is Cree for Beaver Hills House. That's located on Treaty 6 territory and also Métis Region 4. So I am a guest over here. So I've been here for about 10 years. So thanks for having me still, Treaty 6. Uh, what else can I say? Yes, I'm a PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies. My PhD research actually revolves on Métis Métis experience of religion. I don't want to say spirituality. I'm starting to rethink that word and um, I guess replace it with the word relationality. So how we relate to one another. And a lot of that does revolve around, yes, relationships do extend past just our human relations, right? So we have relationships with our ancestors as well who have passed long ago. And a lot of that is we connect through them through storytelling. So I do a lot of work with with Indigenous storytelling. I'm actually also a co-host of a podcast called Miss Naya and Iskwayak, which translates from Cree into book women. So it's actually three librarians. There's no word in Cree for librarians. So we are book three book women <laughs> writing and basically asking, interviewing local Indigenous storytellers about how and why they tell stories. And the hope is to inspire um, I don't want to say younger, but pretty much anybody, any Indigenous person to get their story out there because that's so important this way when we connect with each other and also to those who have passed on. So in terms of what else, actually, before I move on, what else am I doing professionally? I'm also working as a an instructor, a sessional instructor in the School of Library and Information Studies. Again, I'm a trained librarian, so I do a lot of that kind of work and I'm working with them. Um, the Dean of Native Studies, Chris Anderson, on Aboriginal Policy Studies, which is a research journal. Lots of stuff about stories, for sure. <laughs> Done some con consultation work um, on appropriate terminology and how we as Indigenous peoples and me as a Métis woman represent myself and write about myself, right, in respectful ways. So in terms of Ernest Becker, I am just dipping my toes into this. I have recently come across this work and I imagine that's gonna be added to my comprehensive exams. So I'm really excited to see how that kind of pans out and how this conversation goes. But at this point, I, I don't wanna to comment too much on my involvement because it's still a big question mark. So I'm excited to see how that, how that pans out. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Thank you for having me also. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, there's no better time than uh, the present to be exploring Ernest Becker, I think, with the world in existential crisis. Um, so um, that is our, that, that's our introductions. And so we would like to open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the YouTube chat. Okay, so here, here is one question that we have. How has your culture influenced your personal relationship to death? Tanya, we'll start with you. <laughs> okay, I, I feel like I'm gonna talk about storytelling for the next 40 minutes. But <laughs> really, the way that we talk about, and I recently wrote an article just kind of starting to get some of my ideas on paper, but. I never even realized this until I introduced my current partner to my family. 
we sat all down for dinner together and we were kind of just joking around about our different relatives and things like that, you know, silly stuff that we do, like, you know, accidentally put a hole through the wall, trying to get through the garage or something like that. And I turned to my partner after dinner and was like, hey, did you realize that a lot of these people that we were talking about have actually passed on? They're no longer, they're no longer living really. Um, and he had no idea. So this is something that I'm starting to piece together is that in my culture, the way that we talk about people who have passed is as if they're still living and we tell stories about them like they're still here because we still connect through them through story. Like storytelling provides this really fascinating space where time isn't linear like we're taught in school, right? It's, it's time can exist in all different moments and that's our way to connect together. And, you know, also the stories that we tell is if you are, Okay, let me rephrase this. So in a lot of other cultures, we tend to not speak ill will of the dead, you know? And in our culture, it's like, you know what? If you were a goofball in life, then you're a goofball in death. And you know, the same thing goes with if you were a grump in life, then you're also, we're gonna talk about you the same way. And that's just how we, how we do it. So we just talk about it through stories and laugh. And I think we all have a really good sense of humor about it. But yeah, it's something that I'm starting to, piece together and unpack a little bit on my own. Great. Uh, Lamar and Sheldon, do you have any thoughts on this? Want to go first, Lamar? Or go ahead. Um, I think it's interesting as a, a Cheyenne funerals, if you went to a Cheyenne funeral um, now, you would see that there, they always sing this white antelope song. And there was a death song that, that most Cheyennes had. You, you had your own personal death song, you know? And so, and today they, they continue to sing white antelope song. And he was a, he actually died at the Sand Creek Massacre, um, the massacre that was, um, happened here in Colorado, the state where I'm living right now, um, it happened on the plains and uh, nearly 250 Cheyennes were brutally murdered, uh, peaceful Cheyennes were brutally murdered in their sleep um, by a volunteer cavalry from Colorado. But the White Antelope song, it translated, it, he sings, uh, nothing lasts forever, uh, only the rocks live forever. Um, and so there, I think there is more of a, uh, less of a, and I think there's a authentic sadness. If I juxtapose the, the cultures that I grew up in, there is an authentic sadness that happened at Cheyenne funerals that you probably wouldn't see it at Christian funerals. Or if you went to a, um, I, I think sometimes everybody, oh, it's a party, it's a funeral, and we're here celebrating and we're celebrating life. Or, but but there is a sadness that you, an authentic sadness that happens at Cheyenne funerals that uh, you're no longer going to see this person on earth. Um, um, so that's. Those are the those are the, the strong feelings that are there. Um, also, Cheyennes, you, we you'll see that we paint actually, and so that we do that for a lot of different ceremonies. But uh, but part of that is we they'll they'll paint the body, and it's part of that is so your relatives will see you. Uh, that our afterlife is we our spirits travel across the Milky Way, um, and our relatives will see us uh, with our Cheyenne paint on and recognize us as a as a Shy, as a Tista as a Cheyenne, you know. So they'll get to see us and coming across that that uh, Milky Way. And much like uh, Tanya was saying, is if if you're an asshole here in uh, life, then you're going to be an asshole in death. <laughs> and so um, there's no heaven and hell. There's no good, uh, better place or uh, worse place or anything like that. It's 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 everybody goes to the happy hunting ground, so to speak. And so. Um, but yeah, that's that's my answer. Lamar, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just just a brief, and I think I think all Native people reconcile with this, and it's it's the loss of our rituals, loss of our ordinances that we traditionally and culturally have, uh, and, and and I mean going back um, centuries, uh, a lot of those have been lost, and and. Native peoples right now are trying, currently trying to reclaim those, trying to um, recapture what we had at one time, and certainly with death. And, and so it's really hard. A lot of that has been um, put upon Native peoples, our psychology, the psychology, uh, the angst that we have about living, the existential angst that we have about death uh, has been part of the colonization process that we've encountered and, um, and limiting our practices uh, how we bury our dead, how we uh, uh, 
remember our dead, even uh, all those have been changed and influenced. And so people are currently trying to recapture that. And, and, uh, and, and I'm always kind of interested about, you know, even learning about Cheyenne people before we got pushed on the plains, uh, before we even went to um, Illinois and, and Minnesota, uh, learning about who we are. And, and of course, it's difficult to understand that uh, psychology. It's in our stories, though, as Tanya says, and, and uh, some of those can be traced back and understood. But certainly, a lot of those stories have been influenced by Christianity, um, our, our prophets, sweet medicine. Um, people have suggested that might be Jesus Christ visiting. It's been, that story has been appropriated even. As people suggest that Jesus Christ, that was him, maybe visiting the Cheyenne people here. And, and we can't even have our own cultural hero. You know, that's, um, that's uh, to us, individual to us. And so uh, I think that's what um, I, I certainly am. A, when you ask that question, it's like, I think um, I've taken on, unfortunately, our, our people have taken on the psychology of a lot of people here in, here in the U.S. And so uh, when we, our fear about death and, and what we believe is going to happen in the afterlife. And so it's a hard question to answer for me. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And, and as, you know, our people were moved around, there was quite a bit of death and including, I know, for our group, uh, the Osage, you know, when we got moved to Oklahoma, things got really ugly when oil was developed and, and noticed. Um, so, um, okay, so I have a follow-up question for you, Tanya. Uh, to clarify, the dead always spoke, um, uh, or the, to clarify, the dead always spoke of in the present tense, yes? Or is the dead only, sp sorry, I'm reading from the chat. The dead is only spoke of in the present tense, yes. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it, it is a lot of present tense stuff, of course, but I mean, it's the way that you tell any story. Like there's two different types of stories in Métis culture. I mean, we have the more traditional stories which tend to revolve around like nature and ways of being and things like that, but there's also personal histories. And I mean, uh, this is pretty common among um, most indigenous cultures, right? And for personal stories, and this goes the same, if you're gonna say, tell a story about something that happened yesterday, yes, you're gonna say it in the past, but the way that you tell it and the way that you characterize what had happened and who was involved in this story, it's very, very different when, um, I guess you're talking in, a, in more of a Christian context that you don't wanna say anything bad and you do use the past tense, like they used to do this, they're, they and. I find a lot of conversations, they do say that, yeah, this person is no longer living or this person has passed. But when we talk about that, it, it's it's so lively and it's so connected that there's no way that you would be able to tell that the person that we were talking about was was gone or had had passed away. I guess it's, it's one of those really subtle nuances in terms of the tone, because it's not always told in the present tense, but it's just the way that it's told. <laughs> I can't describe it any other way. It's just, it's one of those bizarre things that if you're there and you're hearing a story, you could, you would imagine like, okay, this person, he's just in a different province right now, or this happened last year. But no, a lot of these stories have actually happened before even I was even born, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have experienced <laughs> that as well. So I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and hopefully our viewers do as well. So there, we have another question from one of our viewers. Uh, this person says, I work in advanced care planning, discussing end of life dis decisions. I would like to broaden our documents and approach to be more inclusive for indigenous people. Any advice? Um, Sheldon, we'll start with you since you are the lawyer in the group. <laughs> 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 um, I think, and I don't know, we do, I do a lot of teaching of um, non-Indians and how they, how to work with Indians. <laughs> um, and really I talk about this and it's a practice out of medicine, actually. It's a, it's a practice out of medicine is cultural humility. Um, and it's really allowing, because of all the effects that Lamar's talked about is the uh, forced assimilation has had really broad impacts. And so um you wouldn't really get to understand my culture unless you had the humility to listen to it, you know? And so unless we could have an authentic, you could build a relationship of trust and we could build a bridge that you could really understand um, what the family is feeling or what I am feeling as a, as a 
Cheyenne man living in Denver, Colorado, you know, so it, it would take uh, a practice as a, a, of cultural humility to really get those. And so building those relationships of trust uh, and being able to understand and talk to individuals about some of these very sensitive areas, especially death, the, the most sensitive area, you know, so it'd be really important to be able to build that level of trust so you could understand and, and meet those families where they're at. Do you have any suggestions for how this person might reach out to someone to uh, provide that advice for them? Um, I, I, it, it really all starts out of trust. And I feel like that's the, the key component there. And especially when you're a professional. Um, and so you, you have to build, the, the first thing is building that relationship of trust with, um, with, with the people that you're working with. Um, and so, and really, so that it takes, it, it takes time actually. It, it's so much is about relationships and so much is about story actually, as, as Tanya is kind of talking to us about. So um, a lot of connection happens through story, um, but building that relationship of trust is, is the foremost. I completely agree. Uh, any other thoughts from Tanya and Lamar on that? Actually, yeah, if I could jump in and just piggyback on what, what Sheldon was saying is that, yeah, absolutely. Trust building is so, important and active listening, like in um, where I'm from here, uh, living in Edmonton, what we do is we have different traditions that actually teach us to learn more about active listening. So we have something that's called a sharing circle and that's um, everyone sits in a circle and there's specific protocols around it. And everyone has a turn to say what they need to say and everyone else around them has to sit and listen. And that goes the same with um, elder stories. So if you have a conversation with an elder, oftentimes they'll teach you a lesson through a story, but it's a different storytelling because it's very cyclical. And if you hear an elder tell a story, sometimes they'll go this way, that way, all sorts of different ways, right? And I know often people um, that weren't raised with that tradition, they'll be like, well, what's the point? What's the point? Where are you getting at? Like you're, you're steering this in, in a weird direction here, but that's part of the lesson too, right? Is that, if you, you as a listener also have a job and that is to pick out the pieces that are relevant to you at that specific time. And of course you can listen to the same story and pull out different lessons every time you hear it, right? So if that's actually a really important thing when you're working with indigenous peoples is that level of trust. And that comes with active listening and you know being humble and turning on that empath part of that is alive in everybody, right? That being said, I have more like solid constructive ways also to approach in terms of like documenting and stuff like that. You want to write about indigenous peoples in a respectful way. So I actually teach this, I do lectures on um, indigenous approaches to grammar and things like that. And I highly suggest, I mean, obviously this is within a Canadian context because this gentleman who wrote this book is, uh, he was from, um, British Columbia, but I'll show it here. It's called Indigenous Elements of Style. So I recommend this to everybody. It talks about nuances of terminology, um, the difference of using past tense versus present tense. I know in a lot of textbooks and textbooks that I was raised with, they talk about our ceremonies in the past tense, but we still celebrate this stuff. We, we're still doing the stuff that we're doing. And in terms of capitalization, it even talks about, for example, I know Sheldon was talking earlier about uh, rocks and our ancestors and plants and things like that. Like the land in general is our relation as well. So that's who we connect with, they're our cousin. And it, it talks about those types of nuances that you wouldn't necessarily learn, or I certainly didn't learn in elementary school, not even in university classes, but uh, something like capitalizing the word land that elevates it to a position of being almost like a human, right? Because I know in, in Western society or we often put ourselves in binaries where it's a power dynamic, right? And we don't have to do that. So I suggest reading this book. I mean, educating yourself on Indigenous history and from, you know, the States and also from Canada, like North American Indigenous history is really important because then you get that perspective, which will enhance your ability to approach these topics with an, with an empathetic ear. Lamar, have anything to add to that? Yeah, just briefly, um, I appreciate what everyone said in here. Um, I think one of those things that I think both Sheldon and Tanya have alluded to comes with, and I wish this is something 
uh, native could, native culture could um, influence our society because there is some, certainly a political hegemony and, and cultural hegemony that was taken away and, and, and installed in our tribal communities and, and, and is modeled constantly and reinforced constantly, whether it be in schools or in a courtroom or even higher education. Um, and certainly maybe what this guy is asking the question about in his practice of financial, uh, providing financial support and uh, literacy to people um, this idea of convincing people, I mean, I can't think of a, a more way to lose trust and relationship is when you try to influence and convince someone that this is the better way to do it, rather than letting people have the power to do that themselves. And our, our, our society is ripe with that. Every meeting we have, we think it's our job to influence and convince people to do it our way. And, and, I, and it just turns people off immediately, certainly American Indian people. And, uh, and we have a lot of mistrust for our institutions to begin with. And so I think to I'll go back to this question, if, if there is a way, and, and the form is kind of a short circuit to building relationships, unfortunately, as well. And so uh, the form might be needed, but if there's a way to have a personal relationship and listen to people and hear their values and, and, and understand their values, um, I think that, that will go a long way to building trust, like Sheldon said, and, and, and impacting having something where someone sees value in what you're bringing to them uh, from a native perspective anyway. Yeah, I would completely agree. Trust is absolutely key and not hard to get. I mean, we, you know, our people obviously do not trust non-Indigenous for a very good reason based on history. So um, yeah, definitely I would, I would echo that. Just it, it may take a while, but definitely just keep trying. So I have another question from one of our viewers. Uh, this question states, how do indigenous cultures incorporate or reconcile science in terms of the stories you tell and the ideas you have about death? Lamar, would you like to take that? Yeah, um, I'll humbly take this question. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on any of that. And, um, and, and, only, and I'll say this, you know, I speak for myself and and, and not necessarily everyone even in my culture and in my tribe. And so I, I can only speak from what I've learned and what I've gone through and my experiences. Um, and I think, you know, first of all, there was never this compartmentalization like we do in our society now about, you know, the arts and the sciences. There was never that. These were all uh, uh, part of our society. They weren't partitioned out. Uh, certainly our spirituality wasn't checked at the door when we went to work or went to school. Uh, it was embedded in our cultures and, and there was no uh, bias or prejudice about doing that. And, um, and so, and I understand maybe why in our society, why we have the separation of church and state, but that's something to understand is what we never had those. We never had this, uh, people were scientists. There were certainly indigenous scientists, um, our agriculture and um, our political history and, and certainly things and our knowledge of the astronomy and the stars is uh, unsurpassed, I, I believe. And, and so I think that's certainly been well documented. Uh, and, but I don't think people uh, uh, kept those separate. People didn't keep those separate. And, and, and now in our culture, we do. We have this kind of philosophy about how we keep that and how we see the world through, through different lenses. Uh, and, and we never had that. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. T uh, Tanya or Sheldon? I'll jump you in. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, I did switch switch to a different mic. Okay, perfect. Um, I think uh, I think you could see the Western influence, and I, I think sometimes, especially uh, all of us have gone to school, you know, like we've we've been conditioned in this idea that there is one truth, there's one answer. Um, and I am getting kind of wacky on you right here, but but I think in an indigenous way of knowing, in an indigenous way of of, of knowledge, um, when sweet medicine, Lamar talked to you guys about our cultural hero, sweet medicine, when the mountain opened up for him and he went inside of it, he he talked to the Mahian, the holy people. There was multiple gods in there, you know, so there's multiplicity, uh, and there was different ways of knowing. Um, those gods all represented different. Uh, different ways of knowing um and so there there wasn't necessarily a one truth and i think that's oftentimes influenced by christianity as well as science is that that there's there's one god there's one truth um but i think in in cheyenne life you could see this like in our ceremonies and i, I know tanya brought that up is that you see allegory 
Um, and I feel like allegory and story and metaphor, um, that sends a deeper message and when it informs our relationship to the earth and our responsibility to take care of the earth, for example. Um, um, but you see so much of that happening in our ceremonies that like the sun, where Sundance tribe uh, Cheyennes are, um, the fundamental aspect of that, that ceremony is just really twofold is what I was told uh, by my elders as it's, it's reaffirming your relationship to humanity and, and to the earth. And, and it's all about science <laughs> and it's all about our, us being good stewards uh, and, and, and us taking care of, of humanity and our relationships. And so that we do that every year, we renew that every year. Um, and it's important for us to remember that. But there's so much about like where I, I see Western religion and Western science kind of intersects, intersect with this is that, for example, um, and I've, I think I gave this example in the interview that Lamar and I did is that, um, in the, in the nest, when they pull up at the center pole at, at the Sundance, they say there's a trickster character in there that's half buffalo, half man. Everybody knows that, that there's not literally a half buffalo, half man living in the nest of the Sundance, but that metaphor and that allegory of a trickster, all of us could relate to that. Um, and it might land different for me than it is your experience, um, but we all interpret what that means, a trickster character in our lives. And we all have trickster characters in our lives, you know, like um, that will fool us one way or, or, or make us think we're our egos, our heads super big or, or make us feel like we're lower than dirt, you know, like, like and so we have these trickster characters that always are, are doing that. So I, I feel like um, tribal culture and our connection to story. I, I like Tanya's talking about that. I'm gonna have to listen to her podcast, but just that connection to story definitely informs our worldview and our indigenous ways of knowing, which might be a little bit different um, than getting to know the one truth, you know, like the one way to get to that point. So um, that's my answer. I too um, have put Tanya's podcast on my to listen <laughs> list as well. <laughs> Tanya, do you have any opinions on this? <laughs> uh, absolutely. First of all, thank you. <laughs> Definitely take a listen. Uh, for I am also not a scientist. I don't even want to kid myself. That being said, I mean, I've had scientific teachings and things like that since I was a kid, but I never ever, we didn't label it that way. And that kind of goes on to what Lamar was saying, right? We didn't have these uh, silos of this is this is this way, this is this way, this is this way. It was basically like, it was just everything is complex. There's no even sense of dividing it up into a single universal truth that doesn't even make sense, at least within our culture. That being said, the way that I was taught like these scientific ways is through our relationships. And I wanna emphasize this again, that our relationships is not human to human only, it's human to non-human. And I wanna talk a little bit about berry picking because this is where I see the, the scientific action in work, right? So we have very specific cultural protocols of how to go approach picking berries, especially berries in the wild, like from the bush. And I'm not going to list them all, but there's certain ones like, of course, like go, go with your family to pick berries and going with the family reinforces our unit as a community, right? Our community. So we go together and then afterwards we all make jam, you know, and it benefits all of us. So it's reinforcing community for each other, but also when we are picking berries, we're not there, we're not allowed to overpick. Like it's not, that's not something that we're supposed to do. We have to be very cognizant of how much we pick as well. Like we can't take every single berry off of the bush. And the reason for that is because for one, it'll allow the plant to regenerate a lot better. And also it, it feeds the animals, like the birds and other animals that might be in the area that might be hungry too, right? So it's it's those little things to, to keep the plant alive for not only the season, and not only the plants and animals that are around in this season, but for future generations as well, right? So even still, like when we go picking and things like that, we have to bring little offerings, like an offering of tobacco, not 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 tobacco that you would get from the store or 7-Eleven or whatever, <laughs> but, you know, ceremonial tobacco that is organic stuff. It doesn't have any of the extra garbage that we see in tobacco today. And, you know, giving back to the earth in that way. So it also replenishes the soil and ensures that the plants are here for future generations. So it's not just about us, it's about our children, our children's children to make sure that they have berries too, right? 
Thank you. That was a beautiful illustration. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit to what we were speaking to earlier in the webinar with this next question. From an indigenous perspective, how do you think terror management theory might explain European colonizers' cruelty against indigenous people in the past and current apathy in North America? Uh, let's start with Sheldon. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I don't know, this is where I, I, I feel like I squarely believe that actually, that's uh, what I, I work off of. And I, this idea that I think Europeans coming to uh, the new world, and we see it, actually, this is a, a lot of early contact. I think tribal people's re reaction was like, what? Why are you guys here? Like, you're your peoples and your stories and your places are all over there. You know, like you left your dead, like you buried them and then you came over here. You're, this is not your, your world, you know, like you could see that from time and time again, that was, there was like kind of a shock. Um, but I, I think that mindset of, of getting more um, individualism, European individualism of, and, and capitalism on top of that, you know, of like I'm trying to get more wealth, I'm trying to acquire more, um, where there's not this communal idea that Tanya's talking about where I pick berries and then we, we're all going to benefit. Um, but, but I think definitely you, you could see it today. And I think where we're at right now is as far as um, America has a, we have amnesia, you know, like, and, and we want to forget and, and indigenous peoples and actually living is a radical thing. Actually being a native person in 2020 is a radical thing uh, because America has tried to, so much to erase us and race our, our experience. You could see this in law as well. They struggle with this. And it's funny, uh, in law school, the, you take property. Every, for every first year law student takes property. And one of the first cases that they have you read in property is an Indian law case. It's the Johnson v. McIntosh case. Um, and it's two white people arguing about who has better title to the land. One guy got his land title from the US government uh, and another guy bought his title from the tribe. Like, so who, who, has, those, who, who, got, who has the rightful title to this land, you know, was the, was the debate on this, this case, the issue at, at hand on this case. And so United States, this is the great big question. How the thievery of land, how do you justify that? How do we justify the genocide of indigenous peoples? Um, we haven't fully justified that. America hasn't fully justified that and reconciled that. And so there is so much truth and reconciliation that needs to occur within our society. And we see it, and it reflected in child welfare, the work that I do. We see it in the criminal system. Uh, we see it in the marginalization of, of tribal voice and tribal perspective. Um, so I, I, I see, I, I can't help but see it everywhere I look. <laughs> uh, and I think terror management theory, uh, theory informs that um, of the terror of, uh, culture, especially religion. Um, you see the forced assimilation of indigenous ch children going way back uh, for 500 years. Um, so there's, there's a lot to this actually, um, the deep questions. Yeah, I agree. Lamar, do you see anything differently from your perspective in your, in your profession? Yeah, certainly let's throw education in there. Uh, talking about an institution a colonizing institution to this very day that still takes people and we have a monoculture, one language is spoken here, one epistemology is thought here. And, and certainly American Indians as well as other people who might not even know it, and, and white people, European included, have lost access to who they are and their, who their ancestors are, and certainly their language as well. And so, um, you know, Joel Spring, the famous, um, author about, who, who writes about American school and writes about the history of American school. And he argues in the very opening chapter, the book that has nothing to do with native people, but he writes in there, he says, the American school was built to deculturalize people. And he argues that. And at first it was American Indians, then it was the freedmen, then it was the savage Irishmen and the savage Italians. And he talks about all these others that came. And so we've all been influenced uh, by schools, by K-12, by higher education. Uh, we've been marginalized, we've lost this access to uh, our humanity, but also a, a wealth of knowledge out there that could influence uh, how we treat the environment, that could provide edification of how we treat our economy and uh, how we see the world and how our responsibility to each other and our community. Uh, and so these ideas that are indigenous are being left out of, uh, left out of these 
uh, areas of knowledge. And um, I think back to, you know, Sheldon Solomon, I remember him doing a lecture one time and he cites um, the, the famous book by Berger and Luckman, um, The Social Construction of Reality. And he talks about when people in, impact, when they, in, when they come in contact with a different culture other than their own, uh, they go through this process. And uh, the first process is we tend to derogate people or we put people down. And you can see that. And I, and I have a framework of, of American Indian history to frame all this in, but certainly it goes throughout the world. Uh, you know, when, they, when people came here, they saw us as savages. They saw us as uncivilized pagans. And it was their job to, you know, Sean talks about um, law, the, the doctrine of discovery, this idea that Indians aren't, aren't even people. Uh, they don't have right to the land. And that's still being cited today, you know, as recently as 2006 in the Supreme Court. And so th this idea that derogated American Indians that put them down. It, and then um, Berger and Luckman go on to talk about the, this idea of assimilation. And that's a way that we reconcile the people's cultures when it threatens us and threatens our epistemology and threatens our existentialism. Uh, we tend to appropriate. And you can kind of see that with American Indian cultures for sure where they've taken the, the things that um, they've, they've profaned the sacred, you know, um, our, our ceremonies and our, our, our dances that are very spiritual and sacred, they've kind of turned them into entertainment and, uh, and, and they let Indians come out when there's um, a, a, a party or a celebration, but they don't want the spirituality aspect of that. And so I think that's very obvious to see. Uh, Berg and Luckman also talk about appropriating. Uh, and I think we definitely can see that in white culture with American Indian um, you know, iconography. You know, we talk about mascots and how American Indians are, are represented to this day. And they're, they're always represented in the past. And it's hard for us to fight and argue for our rights when a lot of people don't even realize we still exist. We still are here and, and still have connection to this, to this uh, world that we live in. Um, and then Bert and Luckman, they kind of sum it up all over. When all those three things fell, then we turned to annihilate. So uh, we, we annihilate. And there's evidence of that. Certainly in this country, although there's a denial of that, we don't even understand or reconcile about the genocide that happened on this land uh, in, in North America, South America, and, and as well as Canada. You know, uh, this genocide that happened, we've never had a truth and reconciliation for that in this land. And, and I think there's a lot of things that has led to, you know, that has a lot of things. Um, and I appreciate Cornell West. When people talk about America's first original sin, they, they throw slavery in there, but great Cornell West talked about, you know, the first sin, America's first sin was to indigenous people. And that's something we're still trying to hide and sweep under the rug to this day. And it has profound consequences on, on our policy, our public policy going forward, our educational, policies and certainly law and everything else. Absolutely, I completely agree. So Tanya, you are a little different from um, Sheldon Lamar and I because you are in Canada. So can you speak to this question in regards from the perspective of being Canadian and um, having a, uh, being a part of a Canadian uh, tribe? Yeah, so as much as yes, absolutely, we're in a very different context here, but I see the same things that all three of you have seen and have discussed about already in Canada. And I guess one thing I could specifically talk about is um, Indian residential schools. And I wanna talk about this because September 30th is coming up and in Canada, that is our day, it's called Orange Shirt Day. And it's our way to recognize survivors and intergenerational survivors of residential schools. Now, if you don't know what that is, it is the boarding schools where uh, Indigenous children were stolen from their families and put into these schools. And there is lots and lots of deaths associated with that, physical violence, sexual violence, all sorts of different violence. And I myself is, am an intergenerational survivor. So I see a lot of the trauma within my own family, within my own nation, and you know, within myself. I am going through my own personal journey of kind of reconciling this within myself too. Um, but I also, you know, I want to be very, very careful about how I answer this question, because 
part of my family's teachings and part of what I've learned through the stories that came out of the residential school experience is that yes, I, my ancestors have experienced this violence from priests, from nuns, all those sorts of things. But what they taught me is that we have to be strong and resilient because we are super strong and we know what we're doing. And a lot of that power, just like Lamar was saying earlier in this conversation is a lot of that power comes from revitalizing our culture and being strong as a nation and, you know, being confident in what we're doing because a lot of times, and I want to talk about and shift my conversation over to like a religious context because Sheldon was talking about religion as well. And we have a lot of instances of Catholicism in our culture, in Métis culture. In my family stories, the, the devil, we call him Lijab. That's the midshift word for the devil, but Lijab is in most of our stories. And it's really interesting because some of the stories that you listen to, yes, of course, they're influenced by Christianity and all of these other things and um, European settlers. However, you, if you start to look at these stories, there are Métis elements all over the place, man. You know, like the devil, if you look at the character and you start listening to our stories, that's our trickster. That is our trickster kind of reminding us of the different pathways that are available to us. And it is all on our free will to choose the pathway. But a lot of times the devil is there to remind us of our culture. So for example, uh, there is one story that um, my grandpa used to tell us is called the farmer and the farmer essentially he started skipping out on church every Sunday because he wanted to stay home and uh, groom his prized horses. He had these giant, beautiful horses. So he would stay home and brush through their manes, right? And he was spending so much time with these horses that again, he would skip out on the Sundays and the, the priest of the village would come and say, Hey, you're not supposed to be doing this. You know, you're going to be punished here. And he didn't listen. He's like, whatever, <laughs> I'm just going to stick with my horses and do my thing. And the story goes on and on like that with the priest kind of giving him warnings. Hey, don't do this. You're going to be in trouble. And then one day he goes to the, to the, um, to the barn and he starts realizing, I guess, with every week that there's more and more knots and it's taking him longer and longer time to, to come through these horses. And then one day he shows up in his barn and the devil is there or we call him the horned beast in the story. The horned beast is there tying little knots in the mane. And the way that my grandpa used to tell it, of course, he's from a different generation, is that, and the world of the story is, go to church. <laughs> now, when my mom tells the story, of course, again, different generation, she says, no, this is about vanity and not spending too much time on, you know, brushing your hair and not, not to put too much emphasis on that. That being said, the generation that I'm a part of is we are part of that revival, the, the cultural revival that we're bringing this stuff back. We're relearning midshift, which is our language. We're bringing our traditions back. We're doing ceremonies again. Um, so when I see it, it's like, no way, the devil is there. The Lijiab is there to tell us, spend some time with these horses. And the horses, like in our culture, that is the animal. These are the animals that we see when we pass away. Those, that's what brings us home is the horses. So spending time with the horses is actually saying, yeah, you be Métis, be who you are and it's okay. Do you know what I'm saying? So it, I just, I really want to be careful not to fall into that victimization narrative because of course the, the truth is important, but I don't want that. I don't want that to break my spirit. And that's just the way that I was taught, you know? <laughs> Thank you for that story. Um, so we have time for one more question and we're we're running out of time. So if we could all keep our answers just a little briefer on, on these um, so that we can hand things back to Deborah. But our last question today is, what does the panel think about the use of indigenous cultural ideas being used by non-indigenous cultures, European, et cetera, to cope with climate grief and associated death anxiety. And this individual also says, thank you for the opportunity to ask and thank you to the panel for sharing your insight and stories. So uh, let's start with Lamar. Can you repeat the question? I just got a phone call. I had to yeah, answer. absolutely. Right. I read it kind of quickly. What does the panel think about the use of indigenous cultural ideas being used by non-indigenous cultural cultures, such as European, et cetera, to cope with climate grief and associated death anxiety? 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's maybe why I'm here today is to share a perspective that um, may have been lost from, from, our, from our ideas and from our epistemology. Um, one thing I think that's really important for other people to realize is whether you're indigenous to this land or to your homeland, uh, we were all one time tribal people. We had responsibility to our community, to someone more than ourselves, or even just our nuclear family. We had responsibility to our tribe and to our community. And, and that, unfortunately that's kind of been lost, uh, certainly. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of the social ills we continue to reconcile with, we, we continue to struggle with, uh, certainly in this political climate that we live in now and, and the problems that are, we're facing as a, as a human, as humans. And so, so I think for me, yes, there's so, there's just so much in my culture as well as other tribal cultures that need to be heard. Um, this idea of decolonizing ourselves. Um, American Indians know what that is and know what that means, but it's something that's just not for American Indians as well. And it's, it's for everyone that lives on this land because we're all been victimized by this idea of colonization, uh, by losing our identity, by losing our language, by having these thoughts and ideas that threaten us, um, you know, our terror management theory that sometimes threaten us, these, uh, these other political ideas, and, and now even things that are, threaten our well-being, if, um, but we've turned them into a culture war, like even just wearing a mask, you know, and uh, there's got to be room for us to listen to other people's ideas, and there's got to be room for us to understand and, and listen to each other. And I think that's kind of the tragedy of what's going on now is um, maybe we're so close. And so um, our mortality, there's, there's not been a hero system for us to access. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I speak of, you know, Becker talks about this in Escape from Evil. And he talks about tribal people were kind of lucky in the sense that their hero system was accessible. Um, to be a hero in our tribe was to care about your elders, to share uh, the berries, to share the meat, um, to um, perform what your responsibility was to your community. And, and that responsibility was defined for uh, even our youngest child. They, they, had, they knew who they, who they were and what was expected of them. And, and that grew as they grew. And so, um, and unfortunately those have been taken away from a lot of people and, and more and more people every day are losing that uh, identity of what they need to do. And, and, and some of these things now are out of reach really. Um, we kind of talked about the interview. We know who the, the, the people who make a lot of wealth in this country are. And there are heroes, unfortunately. They're, they're the ones who are prominent. And so now for a young people raising up, and I work with these young people, to, to be a hero in our society is now to be LeBron James or to be Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and, and that's the goal and the, and the strive to do that. And so, uh, but that's unfortunate because that's probably not accessible for all of us to be or to, or to strive to be. And so, uh, and so I, I think that that's the one thing that uh, Becker points out in Escape from Evil is maybe we need to go back and remember who we are and, and decolonize ourselves. He didn't use that language, but he was talking about this idea of decolonizing ourselves. And so I think there's something uh, certainly in my tribe that I wish people understood, but there's certainly in something all our viewers or listeners right now, a part of their identity. And, it, and it's gonna be this, it's gonna be we, when we think collectively, when we think rather than I versus we, when we think about we, uh, that, that's where we find joy and that's where we find happiness. And that's where we find our hero, uh, where we can be a hero and, and the hero system that we had once all had and access to. Thank you. And I think that is a great place to end it. Um, I will hand things back to Deborah. Thank you all for, for tuning in today. Deborah. Thank you so much, Lindsay, Tanya, Lamar, and Sheldon. It was really a lot to digest and good stuff. We're so appreciative for your time and expertise. Um, I want to apologize to our audience members for tech problems. If you had difficulty accessing the video, this is our first time working via YouTube and we had a little difficulty, but hopefully everyone got on and heard and this will be available in a full recorded version in the next couple of days. 
Um, if you're someone who has ideas for other topics that you would like to hear Ernest Becker Foundation webinars about, or if you have a social justice cause you work with where you would like a presentation from the Ernest Becker Foundation, we're now tailoring our presentations to different social justice causes, and you can reach out to me or to our very wonderful Lila Rothschild, who is offline today, but who is behind everything good the EBF does. Just a reminder that we're a nonprofit organization. We operate on a shoestring. I'm the unpaid volunteer uh, leader of this organization. So if you like this kind of programming and want to keep the EBF staffed with Lila and Corey and the other great people we work with, please give a donation at our um, website. And also, even if you can't give a donation today, please make sure you're signed up for our emails so that we can keep you apprised of our next events. Um, I want to thank everybody. I want to do a little self-promoting pitch and encourage you all to look at yesterday's Seattle Times. I had an op-ed in it about uh, death anxiety and police culture. As we've mentioned, we're trying to move more and more into um, how to apply the knowledge we've we've developed through Becker and TMT to make the world a better place. With that, thank you again to our wonderful panelists and to Lila for making it happen. We appreciate <laughs> appreciate all of you for being here and have a good Monday. Thanks. Bye.